goal setting is what we're going to be talking about now. But Kate's already talked to you a little bit about goal setting for the individual. What I'm going to talk to you about is a little bit more what else you can do with goal setting. One of the first things you want to do is when you hire a new employee, ask them what their one-year goals are and what their five-year goals are. This is not a question that people are used to being asked early in their employment, but it does a couple of things. One, it gets them thinking about being at your program for longer than six months, which is always good because we want to reduce our staff turnover, both for the employee morale and also for the well-being of the kids. But it also helps them to think about advancement in their career. And it helps you to know where they think they're going. If they think in one to five years, they would like to be a chef, well then that tells you that this might be somebody who could work on your menus, or if you do the food program, maybe you would, have, you would start moving them towards being a food handler or a food manager. Uh, or if you're on the food program, why not try to get move towards one in a year or two years them being completely in charge of the food program doing the cooking the menus the accounting for the food program all of that so instead of fighting against the fact that they have a goal that doesn't immediately seem related to child care you're working with them and you're making it work for you i've also had people tell me that their goal is to be in the air force well, that tells you that they're a warrior type of spirit. This is probably not necessarily the person that you're going to want in your infant room. Sometimes they're very good in there because they have real good focus. But I found that the teacher who wanted to be in the Air Force did great in the toddler classroom. It also just helps to give you a little bit of insight into who they are. By having them do that goal, you can then take that and fold it into their personalized training plan. Having your staff set their own training plan, or at least part of it, makes it much easier when you go to do... Joanna, please stop. Joanna, honey. What? Um, you're making noise with the futon. And it carries over. Um, Um, so having them set their own training plan, their own personalized where they want to go and how they want to get there really can help you a lot because they have more buy-in because they've decided how they would like to learn and what types of areas they would like to focus on. There are some things in training that we all know that your staff need to do. You know, once every year, everyone who works with children under two needs to have the infant brain development sh SIDS and shaken baby. Um, it's a good idea once every year or two years to have all your staff go over supervision, um, just to remind them of what that actually means. Um, Bloodborne diseases and um, back safety are good things to do every year or two years. These kinds of things, they don't get to decide in their training plan. But they can decide, for that one who wanted to be a chef, that they want to take a nutrition class at the local college or university. Or that they would like to take every workshop that they can find on uh, stretching the food budget or fun cooking projects to do with children. Those kinds of things will really help. And it allows them to decide or to at least think about the various different ways to get training, whether they're going to do it face-to-face, -face, through workshops, through videos like this one that we're doing today, whether they like to do self-instructional, or whether they like to do internships or mentoring. All of these are perfectly good options for training if they meet the basic criteria for effective training, one of which is having goals and objectives in your training. Then they have to have materials and exercises to work through and a way to check to see if they've done that. Which segues pretty well into our next section which is using goal setting in your curriculum. You need to know what it is that you want the children to be able to accomplish. What you want to accomplish with your curriculum and your program. 
This goes back to what we were talking about before in, goal, in uh, quality. Um, what does quality mean to your program? Is your program uh, academic focused? Is it exploratory learning focused? What is your focus? If you can put down in writing what your general goals are for a two-year-old, what your general goals are for an infant, what your general goals are for a young elementary school student to accomplish while they're with you, it makes it so much easier to come up with curriculum that makes sense for them. Once you've done that based on your quality assessments and what you're wanting the students to accomplish over the course of a year, then you need to think a little bit on a smaller scale. What do you want them to accomplish? What do you want for them to be able to learn or accomplish in individual segments? Sometimes people do month-long units or week-long units, whatever works for your program, but those units need to have goals and objectives associated with them. For instance, it's February and so you know that Valentine's Day is going to happen, but you want the students to learn more than just the shape of a heart and the colors red and pink. You want them to learn about being friends with one another. So if you have some of those large goals for what you want the children to accomplish during the month, then your month is going to be more successful and you'll have a sense of accomplishment as will your teachers. Um, if they know what they're working towards, then it's much easier for them to be happy with what they're doing um, and to really have a sense of enjoyment and that this is a wonderful place to work. Another part of that curriculum goal setting is to know what different types of materials can teach children. Every toy, every piece of equipment in your center has probably 10 different possible things that the children can learn. And your most popular activities are the ones that have the most different learning objectives that the children can get from them. For instance, your block center um, has probably uh, hundreds of different things that the children can learn. But I've collected a few toys um, that you may have at your center or similar items, and we're gonna talk a little bit about those different things. Soft blocks. Um, these aren't the wooden construction blocks. These are ones that you would identify more with your infant or toddler classroom. But you can use them in all of the different age groups. If you use them with school agers, be aware that they will become projectiles. But that's not really a huge problem as long as you know what that does for the students. Throwing things helps them to build their rotocuff muscles which they have to have in order to learn how to write. If you don't have a well-developed rotocuff, you end up having um, a real hard time writing legibly. Um, and also baseball, softball, uh, throwing things across the classroom, all those kinds of things that you naturally associate with throwing. But it also helps with handwriting and also connections between the right and the left side of the brain because frequently when you throw, you throw across your body, which helps span that area. Uh, a lot of times these soft blocks also are either different shapes or have images on them like this one with the dog, bear, brush, shirt, shoes, etc. And so this can become a vocabulary item. What it's typically thought of is being something for building, stacking two or three of them up, um, and teachers get frustrated a lot of times in an infant room because the children build it up and as soon as they get it close to as tall as they are, they knock it over. And they'll knock other people's towers over when they're about that same height. While that's a developmental imperative, we'll talk about that in child development. But if you know that one of the things that using blocks soft blocks especially does is it helps them with cause and effect. If I hit the top block, all of them will fall over. Then you're not as frustrated when they do that because you're thinking about what are the children learning through this? They're learning cause and effect. They're learning vocabulary. 
They're learning the fine motor and gross motor skills of building, stacking, and knocking. All of these different things. There's probably another 10 or so things we could come up with for this one. Um, but we want to talk about some other things as well. Um, something that uh, some that are not particularly bleh. <laughs> one of the things that children really like to play with but that adults are not particularly fond of are action figures or Barbie dolls characters from stories Prince Caspian Pokemon Spider-Man Batman whatever these ones happen to be Dorothy and the Tin Man why is it a good thing to have these in our program? Why have Dorothy? Why have the Tin Man? Why have Spider-Man? What possible educational value could this have? Well, when you're looking at the goals and objectives, what does this teach? Um, it helps them to relate things that they've seen and practice them without having to involve themselves personally a lot of times having these small items that are very human shaped, <laughs> even if they are silver, um, does help them to play out situations like someone taking their toy um, or things that happened in the movie that they don't really understand so they play it again and again and again through the, play, uh, through the small representative items. So perhaps when you put them out, what you're doing is helping them to stretch a story because we also do this with, you know, bears and zebras and cows and things when we're doing units on farms or wild animals or seahorses and whales when we're doing whales. It's the exact same thing, whether it's the Tin Man or whether it's an orca whale. They're taking the words that they've heard or seen in books and they're relating it to a physical item because they need to from a cognitive point of view. But it can also be something that you use to help them work through social issues. So maybe your goal in putting the action figures out is to help them play through something traumatic that's happened. Or perhaps it's to help them talk about what's right and what's wrong or how we can work together. Um, or to just interact, you may have a shy child who seems to know everything there is about the current hot TV show, um, Yu-Gi-Oh! or whatever it happens to be at the moment, since it changes all the time. And that child is real shy, but they know every single thing. This reminds me of a particular child I knew who knew every single Pokemon and knew how they evolved from Charmander into whatever, into whatever. And the only way he could really successfully play with other kids was when we had those toys out. So we asked the parents if they had spares to bring in because this child talked about these items all the time, so why not go ahead and bring them into the program? So our goal was to help the child who was having a hard time with their social development interact with other children. Um, it may be to write their own story for what happened to these characters after the story that they've already heard. Again, extension, creativity, and verbal language. There's also some fine motor skills. Anybody who's ever worked with preschoolers and had action figures that you could remove the clothes is very familiar with the fact that Barbie shoes are incredibly difficult to get on for a five-year-old. So there are some fine motor skills items involved as well. And sorting, they love to sort the shoes and the shirts and the other items, the Batman accessories. You know, my bionicle has six arms, yours only has two, those kinds of things. So it can also be a sorting activity. Um, it's one of my favorite show and shares is to have everybody bring in a Lego or bionicle or action figure and have the kids then sort those items all through the day. So that's another possible goal you can have with that activity. 
Um, one of my favorite all-time toys is a Discovery toy. It's called the Measure Up Cups. Part of the reason I really like them is because there's so many different things that you can have the children learn with these. They're an amazing to uh, toy. Um, there are 12 cups. They're not all 12 here. There's eight here. But they're serrated. They have an order. Blue, red, green, yellow, blue, red, green, yellow. So the children can be learning patterning. The largest one of the cups has a whale on the bottom. Then the next largest has an elephant, then a hippopotamus, and so on until we get to the smallest one, which is a butterfly. Um, so size gradation there. Um, you can stack them. I think we'll probably do some still shots here. Um, you can stack them on top of each other the more the simple way, with the largest one being on the bottom, or you can stack them the other way. They're also an addition uh, toy in that if you take the number one cup and you fill it up twice and you dump it into the number two cup, it fills the number two cup up completely. So it's a great math toy. It's a cognitive toy because we're learning patterning, we're learning seriation. Um, it's a great cause and effect toy because you build it up, you knock it down. Um, it's good for Play-Doh because we can stamp. We have the little imprints on the back that we can stamp. Uh, so it can help us with our vocabulary of the different animals when we're stamping them into Play-Doh. It's a gross motor toy. We can work on our gross motor skills, grabbing things with multiple fingers uh, in the infant and the toddler age groups with the older kids, um, putting them building the tower from the smallest to the largest is a great fine motor skill and balance activity. So there's lots of different things we can do with this one real simple toy that costs about $10. But if you don't know what types of goals and objectives you can use with this, then it just sits on the shelf until children discover one or two of the things that you can do with it and then they do those one or two things. But if the teacher knows the hundred different things that you can do with unit blocks or you can do with measure up cups, then you can accomplish a lot more and you can help the children stretch their learning in a lot of different ways. The last one I'm really gonna talk about is something that the children love, but the teachers don't. Maracas or jingle bells or drums or pianos, kids love them. And teachers, even if they're required to have them because they're NAEYC accredited and every classroom has to have a music center, the teachers manage to frequently lose their music center <laughs> or close it because if you have a class of 20 children and they're all doing this, it can get on any teacher's nerves. But the goal of having these, why is it that every accrediting agency says that classrooms have to have a music center? There has to be a good reason, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't all say you need to have a music center. Whether it's an infant room or an after school room, you have to have a music center. Why? It just drives the teachers crazy. What possible good could it do? Well, the music does lots of different things. For one thing, it, again, lays down those neural pathways in the brain, um, but it also helps the children with that cause and effect we talked about before. So if you're having children who are having a hard time paying attention to their body, <laughs> um, there's always one kid in the class who runs into other kids and doesn't seem to notice, who seems to not know where the foot is at the end of their leg, who hits people and thinks they're just tapping them, but it's really a pretty good whack. These kinds of things, using the maracas or the drums is amazingly powerful because we need to help them learn touch gently, 
Shake it gently. Okay, now shake it really hard. And they can literally hear the difference, not just feel it in their muscles, which is important, but they get the non, they get the indirect guidance from the toy that this is not, that's not gentle. Because if the child wants to be heard over the maraca, they have to get louder and louder and louder. But if the teacher keeps getting quieter and quieter and quieter, it helps them to really get that concept of what is gentle and what is hard. Not something people typically think about when they think about that music center. It's helping that child who has a hard time controlling their body and knowing where the end of their hand is and how strong they really are. Um, another good thing that you can use, another good goal with the Music Center is taking turns in speech, communicating. So if you have two children in the Music Center, one plays the drum and one shakes the maraca and they have to take turns or they have to do it at the same time. So it could be a cooperative activity. It could be about learning verbal skills, about taking turns. It could be about uh, patterning. You shake it twice, they drum it twice. Um, the goals are can be many and wide ranging. If you have anyone on your staff who's worked with children's music, I'm sure they can come up with a whole bunch of others but it helps the children really learn how to listen to one another, helps them get control of their body. These kinds of things are things that we don't necessarily immediately think about when we think about those types of toys. So think about what can you help the children accomplish with the different toys? What is the goal of having maracas in your classroom? It's not to give the teacher a migraine. Why do we have Hot Wheels? We don't have Hot Wheels in the classroom because we enjoy seeing them fly off the bookshelf and hit a kid on the cheek. But there is a good goal or objective for having this. It help, you know, we put them in because we want the children to know more about transportation or about how roads work. We know that they like to move them, so it's a gross motor activity. Why did you put that piece of equipment down? That's what I mean by goals and objectives, helping your teachers really think about what is that tool and what does it help to teach the children? What is that tool and what does it help teach the children? Thank you. The last part of goal setting that I want to talk to you about is goal setting for your program as a whole. Your program needs to move forward. It needs to change. I don't want your program to be stagnant. I want it to be improving every year to be better than the year before. That's not going to happen if you don't plan for it. And goal setting is the planning for it. Now. This can be something that just the owner or just the director does, but if so, you're missing out on a wonderful opportunity. If that's all you do, then do that. Please don't avoid doing it because I'm going to tell you that it's a good idea to involve your staff and your clients and you're like, I do not want to do that. That's too much work. If that's too much work, then just have the director or the board or the owner work on this um, in its most elaborate form. This is your business plan, but at the most basic, it's goal setting. Okay, you want your program to move forward. You want to make sure that you're reacting to the current economic environment, the current neighborhood environment, and the current needs of families in your area. So this is why I say it's a great idea uh, to involve your clients, um, doing questionnaires or surveys once a year to find out what do they like best about your program, 
what area do they think can be improved and if you could offer one more thing at your program and they could pick it what would it be those kinds of three question questionnaires or five question questionnaires are great So those kinds of three or five question questionnaires are great. Or you can have a survey that says, of these five things that we might do, which one is the, which one would you most like to see? Rank them from one to five. Those kinds of uh, surveys can also be very helpful. Find out what your clientele want from you. <laughs> because if you decide you wanna add an after school program, and you put all of this planning and effort into it, well, what if none of your clients want to use the after-school program at your center? They're perfectly happy with the after-school program they already have, or the fact that their child goes home on the bus. That's a waste of your time and your money. Get feedback from your clientele. Get feedback from your clientele Work with them to find out what you need to do to improve your program, to change your program, to make it more organic, more dynamic. Um, the other thing is to get your staff involved. Your staff have great ideas for how to make your program better. They also have ideas that are a little loopy. It doesn't matter if their ideas are loopy or if their ideas are amazing. If they never get a chance to tell you what the ideas are, they're not going to be happy working for you. They're going to feel like this is one of those places where they're just a cog in a wheel. You want them to be invested in your program. You want them to really feel like this is their home away from home, or at least that this is a place where they are valued not just for their skills, but also for their mind. So once a year at a staff meeting or at a potluck or at someone, you know, at the end of your party, ask your staff if we could change one thing in the next year, what would you like us to change? Then write, write it all down. Write down the silly ones. I thought when I was doing this for a center and one of the staff said, take a nap, I thought this was crazy. Why would the staff think it's okay for them to take a nap while they're at work? I'm not paying you to sleep, was my take on it from a director's point of view. But I recently had another director say, oh, we put a futon and they were lucky enough to have a staff break room and they put a futon in their staff break room and she said it's been amazing for employee morale we put an alarm clock and a futon and we have staff who take one and a half hour lunches and they go in and they take a half hour nap and they're so refreshed it's amazing so something that may seem to you to be kooky as an idea from one of your staff may work out amazingly if you allow them to talk through it so write it all down. Yes, Joe? Um, I was wondering if I'm supposed to have like candy and stuff too. Um, one of those bags is for you, the other one for your sister. I to like the whole co-op or just to my class? Just to your class. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Once they've brainstormed all of it, ask, have the whole group decide which two or three things we're really going to look at to decide whether we're going to move them forward or not. Because you can't, if you have a staff even of five, you're going to have 15 different ideas. And there's no way we can really evaluate 15 of them. So allow them to pick two or three that you're really going to look at. That way you're not the one saying, oh my gosh, taking a nap? Oh, not a good idea, not something we can do. It's their co-workers that are deciding together which ones are important enough to move forward. It may be accreditation. They want to become accredited. It may be that they want to see if there's a scholarship program that will pay for classes for them to take at the university. Or it may be that they want a new playground.
Joe, can you close the door, please? Thank you. It may be that they want a new playground. It may be that they want um, to have Teacher Appreciation Day. Um, or it may be that they want to go to a conference or have a happy hour. I don't know. There's hundreds of different possibilities. But if they come up with the ideas and then they evaluate them, then they will have a lot more willingness to make then they will have a lot more willingness to actually get it done. They will encourage you, they will support you in doing it as opposed to going, oh my gosh, she wants us to become accredited. How much paperwork are we going to have to do? This way, they're going, we're going to become accredited. Everybody's going to know what a wonderful program we have. I can't believe she thinks we're good enough or he thinks we're good enough to become accredited. I can't believe, and they're gonna spend X number of dollars to get us accredited. I, that's just amazing. Where if the director had just said we're gonna get accredited, people would be oh, frustrated with it. So it helps them to really see the advantages of each of those things. The ones we pick the three or four, or the two or three, then you go through and you say, what are the risks and the benefits of each of those? What are the pros and cons? Um, what can we gain from it? How much is it going to cost in time and in money? Um, are people going to get frustrated? You know, look at all of the different issues together as a group and then pick at most two things to move forward for the year. And then we're all working together. You get to share the labor. You're not having to do it all. That's really a good thing. <laughs> It'll cost you less, both in time and money, because a burden shared is a burden halved. And you'll have the buy-in of the staff. They will think this is a good idea, even if their idea didn't move beyond the brainstorming stage. Okay, thank you.